Praise the Lord. We thank God who has brought us here today for something good. And the Lord will touch, transform, turn around your life in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this time. We bless your name. We thank you because you're always there. The God of yesterday, of today, and of tomorrow. The God in the valley, the God on the mountain. The God at difficult times and the God in easy time. The God who promises to bless his people and the God who cannot fail. We are here today because we know you are alive and because we know you have not changed because we know that whatever may be the need, with our God, all things are possible. Amen. And we're asking that today you open our eyes and reveal yourself and reveal your mind unto us so that we'll know that whatever we're going through as individuals, as ministers, as professionals, as families, as churches, as a ministry, we know you'll take us through. Amen. And we know that your power will never fail. Amen. Your wisdom will never fail in our lives. Lord, we pray as you reveal yourself to us today, we'll receive everything coming from the throne of God into the heart of everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. But thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Again, I want to remind you that the theme of the crusade, as well as the theme of the minister's conference, is the God of all possibilities. And because we know that, we're looking at the Word of God on verses of Scripture. That Christ himself, who knows the Father more than anyone knows the Father, that Christ himself, who had been with the Father with God from all eternity, that he reveals to us that with God, his Father, our Father, that with that God, all things are possible. And you want to take that to heart, knowing that whatever path in your way, and whatever situation in your life, and whatever challenges you have in the ministry, in your profession, with our God who has called you and who has placed you where you are. He'll make all things possible. Amen. A greater amen. amen. I'm looking at Mark chapter 10. And we're looking at verse 26. Mark chapter 10, verse 26. And they were astonished out of measure, they were blown away because of what had just happened. And it says the sacred record, the sacred word tells us they were all amazed, astonished, surprised, out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? What an important question. As we think about salvation, as we think about receiving what Christ has brought at Calvary, the most important commodity, possession of any man, any woman, anyone on earth, salvation before we cross from earth, to the other side and before we leave this place to get to the great beyond if there's anything we need to think about it's our salvation and they wondered if this happened to this man 
the young rich ruler that came to Christ and then he went away sad and sorrowful and he didn't have what he was coming for. How can I have eternal life? And he didn't have that. Then they said, if the privileged, if the rich, if the people who've got everything together here in this world, if they don't make it, who then can be saved? And that is what brought verse 27, the declaration of Christ. And Jesus, looking upon them, says, with men it is impossible. But not with God, for with God all things are possible. With God, your salvation is possible. Your redemption is possible. Your holiness is possible. Your sanctification is possible. And your power, power as you are connected with the Lord, with God, all things are possible. Whatever we find difficult, impossible, or realistic in our personal lives, from our salvation, to our growth in the Lord, to the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives, and to success in ministry, and to abundant sufficient provision in ministry, whatever by ourselves we find impossible. From this morning, the Lord will turn the table around. And the Lord will make it possible in your life, in Jesus' name. Today, I'm taking the subject, God's possibilities despite man's impossibilities. God's power despite man's impotence. God's power despite man's powerlessness. God's possibilities despite man's impossibilities. Remember once again what Christ said. Jesus looking upon them says, with men it is impossible, but with God, everybody say with God, all things are possible. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the declared condition of man's powerlessness. The declared condition of man's powerlessness. Number two, the delightful comprehension of God's possibilities. And then number three, our distinct consecration, commitment as God's people. Number one, number one, the declared condition of man's powerlessness. We're reading now the real story from Matthew chapter 19, and I'm reading from verse 16. Please open your Bible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life. He recognized Jesus as master, righteous, holy, just, good. And he says, good master, I want you to tell me what exactly I am to do so that I will have. He knew that there is eternal life. He knew there is salvation. He knew there is that ticket that God gives us through Christ that will open the doors of heaven for us and we get to heaven. And he wanted to know like you must want to know. What good thing shall I do? He knew that salvation is not 
a community salvation. I, what good thing shall I do? You want to understand that salvation, eternal life, and having conversion and connection with God is not a community thing. We come in and we are saved. He doesn't give it to us on the basis of we belong to this group and belong to this uh, uh, to this uh, community. He gives us as individuals. He gives our breath, the breath of life, as individuals. He gives our very life, the physical life to us as individuals. He gives eternal life on the basis of an individual. What good thing shall I do that I, that I, that I may have is something we possess. It's something we have. And it says, what good thing can I do, should I do to have eternal life? Look at verse, verse 17. In verse 17, and he said unto him, why callest thou me good? Now we know that Jesus is good. We know that Jesus is perfect. We know that Jesus is sinless. We know that Jesus Christ is spotless. Why did he ask the question from the man? Because the man was thinking of Jesus as a man like himself. And he was comparing himself with Jesus Christ. He said, good master, I want to be good. And he was, he was, you know, just recommending himself. He knew what he had been doing. And that's why Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There is none that is good. In verse 18, he tells us, he says unto him, which commandment? And Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness in verse 19 honor thy father and thy mother and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself love thy neighbor as thyself love thy neighbor as thyself look at verse 20 in verse 20 the young man says unto him all these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet, man? In superficially answering, the Lord said, I'm all right. If that's to have eternal life, I've got it already because all these have I kept from my youth. Ah. You've loved your neighbor as yourself, that hungry man, and you are full and you are well fed. Have you loved him as yourself, that naked man there? Have you closed him? Have you loved him as your well dressed self? And that suffering man that had been put in prison, incarcerated without any fault of his, have you gone out of your way to rescue him and make him as free as you are free? All these things have I done from my youth and then what lack I yet and he was so proud about what he has done about who he was like many of us we think we've got it and we think we have made it and we're proud and we say I've done that I'm like that. If heaven calls now, I should be in heaven. The moment I die here, that moment I get to the other side. Look at verse 21. Don't make your conclusion yet. In verse 21, Jesus says unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, you want to have eternal life, and you want heaven to recognize you, perfectly that you have that eternal life go sell that thou hast you have too much too many clothes you have you are not using 
too much furniture you have you are not using and choosing many things that make you mobile you are not using you have so many shoes you are not wearing and you have many things you have beyond the necessities of life and you tell me you love your neighbor as yourself all right now go sell what you have and give to the poor the, those people that they are next to nothing and they do not have the wherewithal that they will take care of themselves and it says if you do that thou shalt have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me take care of the poor love them like you love yourself and after that you come and then as i'm going to the other side going to heaven that's where you want to go do that and come and follow me and then in verse 21 but when the young man heard that saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions too great for a man to make use of too much for a man to take care of himself and too much to ever spend while he was here on earth and so for he had great possessions and then in verse 23 it tells us then said jesus unto his disciples verily i say unto you that a rich man who cares only for himself verily i say unto you that a rich man who enjoys putting all that money in the bank and doesn't have any care for anyone i tell you i say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven in verse 24 it says and again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. It's not talking about your needle. Actually, there were some narrow gates in Israel. And so narrow, they call them the eye of the needle because it's so small and so narrow. And the camel to pass through, they will remove all the loads on the camel and the camel alone by itself without the extra load will go in and this man that we're reading about he didn't want to put all the weight all the load all the extras all the things that make life slow and sluggish because he had so much load what he was to do was to take all the load and put all the load down and distribute all the load to the poor and then he will enter through the gate that gets us to heaven he was not able to do that that's why jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of god in verse 25 it says when the disciples heard it they were exceedingly amazed astonished saying who then can be saved that's what brought the answer of the lord jesus christ in verse 26 but jesus beheld them and said unto them with men this is impossible with men unaided 
with men without grace, with men without the help of heaven, with men all alone by themselves in their strength, in their power, in their ability, with men in biological strength and power, with men, ordinary men, this is impossible, but with God, everybody tell me, when God helps you, when God eats you, when God grants you grace, when God grants you the power to shed off everything he wants you to shed off, and you come in the strength, in the might of the Lord. It says, what was impossible with man, unaided man, graceless man, what was impossible for the greatest of men in their own strength is possible only in God, but with God all things are possible. The declared condition of man, unaided man, helpless man, unspiritual man, carnal man, fleshly man, ordinary man, without the extraordinary grace of God, the declared condition of man's Powerlessness. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the impossibility of man's self redemption. That whoever we are, whatever we have, whatever we have done, the impossibility of man's self redemption. Number two, the insufficiency of man's self righteousness. Look at the man. Before Jesus, he said, I've done that. I'm qualified. I can have. I ought to have this. The insufficiency of man's self-righteousness. Number three, the inconsistency of man's self recommendation the inconsistency of man's self recommendation let's look at number one number one the impossibility of man's self redemption self redemption i can redeem myself by my good works i can redeem myself by my action by my human efforts no it's impossible in psalm 49 reading from verse 7 psalm 49 verse 7 none of them can by any means redeem his brother. None. Rich, educated, highly placed, popular, whoever we are, none of them, none of us can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. The only one that can pay the price of our redemption is Christ Jesus because he is God and he is man. Because he is righteous and perfect. Because he is lived from eternity and then he came to earth and he's gone back to eternity stainless, sinless, not a sin any second of a minute, of an hour, of a day, of a week, of any year of his life, perfect. That's the only one. And there's no man, ordinary man, apart from Christ, who has done that. Even Enoch. Enoch lived 365 years, and for 65 years it was like ordinary sinner. And then at the age of 65, he had the grace of God. And for the 300 years left, he was righteous. And God took him away. But 
His life at the beginning was not sinless, spotless, perfect. He even could not redeem anyone. We cannot have self-redemption. Look at verse 8 of that Psalm 49. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. Let's look at number two here. Number two is the insufficiency of man's self righteousness we will see the man and we'll see his declaration as he ran and he came to Christ and said good master what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life he came he actually wanted to publicize his righteousness and Jesus said you know the law you know the commandments don't do this don't do this don't do this and then finally you have uh, you know the summary of that that you will love your neighbor as yourself have you noticed what Jesus told him there are ten commandments Number one relates to God. Number two relates to God. Number three relates to God. Number four relates to God. Then number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number ten relates to man. And the Lord was telling him that all the commandments that relate to man whom you can see. How have you done that? And he said, from my youth, I've done everything perfectly. And now, the commandment relating to God, to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, to love God above money, to love God above riches, and to give up anything, to take care of the poor, of the creatures of God. Let's, co let's consider the commandments of God. And the man could not even answer that, and he went away. You see, the righteousness that he proclaimed, the righteousness that he projected, the righteousness that he publicized, all that cannot save. The insufficiency of man's self righteousness. Isaiah chapter 64, we're reading from verse 6. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. But we are all, all, all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are filled with rags. And we all, look at that, all, all, all the third time. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, it talks about our righteousness even in the plural and yet he says when you think about it the outward action may be all right the outward expression of religion may be all right we may bow at the right time stand at the right time kneel at the right time say the right thing at the right time all that is external all our external righteousnesses they are as filthy rags it says we do all fade as a leaf and our iniquities have our iniquities like the wind have taken us away our self-righteousness is not enough to qualify us for heaven number three here is the inconsistency in man's self recommendation the man had self recommendation he came and he came with confidence he came and he said he didn't even ask permission from anybody he said good master that's you i want to show you how good i am but let me ask a question what good thing can i shall i do that i may have eternal life everlasting life that i may have that salvation that qualifies me for heaven he had self 
recommendation. And when Jesus said, oh, are you asking me that? Do you know the commandments? He said, of course I do. That the study of my life. Okay, go keep those commandments. Let's touch on the lower ones that relates to man. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. And thou shalt not be a false witness against your neighbor. And then put everything together. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. Any neighbor that is lower than you are, with what you have, lift him up. Bring him up so that he'll also be at the same level like you are. Uh -uh. Human beings don't do that. Human beings want themselves to be at the top. And if there is anyone down, they're counting. I'm better than that. I'm better than that. I'm richer than that. I'm more qualified than that. They don't ever want the poor. They don't ever want the underprivileged. They don't ever want the people who are poor and lowly there to come to their level. And when Jesus said, look at the poor, bring them to your level. Look at the poor, look at what you have, and look at what they don't have. Help them, close them, feed them, take care of them. The man went away. His self-recommendation could not get him to where he ought to be. The inconsistency of man's self-recommendation. Inconsistent. He was telling Christ, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. I have done that from my youth. And when the robber meets the road. And when the reality came to him, he couldn't, the self-recommendation could not work. Think about yourself. Your self-redemption, impossible. You can't redeem yourself. I've done this, I've gone there. It's not where you've gone. You've gone to Jerusalem. That doesn't save. You've taking water from river jordan that doesn't save there are people that drink that water every day and they are not saved the self-redemption is impossible and the self-righteousness is impossible to save and the self-recommendation impossible to save how do we get saved we come to christ and we say I performed the experiment. I've tried all I can. I don't have peace of mind. I don't have uh, the sense of forgiveness. I don't have the joy of salvation. I don't have the victory that comes with salvation. And we bend the knee. And we bend the heart. And we put our souls in submission to the Lord. That is how we can be saved. Self-redemption impossible self-righteousness will not save self-recommendation will not save only in christ do i come and put my faith and say jesus i accept you jesus i believe you you are my savior my good works cannot save me and even after I am saved, all will depend on your grace. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift, it is the gift. We don't work for a gift. We accept gift meritoriously that Christ has come, he has suffered unto us, and as we receive that, we are saved. Give me a good amen. amen. We come to number two. Number two, the delightful comprehension of God's possibilities. Delightful, delightful. When we know that my life is in his hand, and because his power, can do all things. He can save. He can purify me from within. 
He can strengthen me from within because God is the God of all possibilities. He can satisfy my life here on earth and then take me to heaven that will satisfy me throughout eternity. The delightful comprehension of God's possibilities we're looking at. Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, verse 20 says, And they that heard it said, who then can be saved. Verse 27, And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Look at three subsections we're dealing with here. Number one, the fact, the fact of God's immeasurable possibilities. So deep, so high, so wide, so broad, immeasurable the instrument of man will measure many things we measure the stage of our health there are instruments to do that we measure the condition of the heart that keeps us alive the instruments to do that we measure the level of our strength they, we even measure while you are driving, the computer is there to tell us how much fuel you have in the tank. Man can measure literally everything, but the love of God is immeasurable. The power of God is immeasurable, and the possibilities in God are immeasurable. The fact of God's immeasurable possibilities. Number two, our faith in God's immense power. Our faith in God's immense power. Number three is the faithfulness to God's immutable promises. Faithfulness. Is so faithful, and the greatest of promises he has given us, those promises, is faithful to fulfill them. He'll fulfill them in your life. Look at number one, is the fact of God's immeasurable possibilities now. Some people have problems with faith. Because they think faith is something they believe in. And as they believe that thing, it will make that thing to happen. Fact, a fact. I don't need a great mountain of faith to accept and believe a fact. Every morning, the sun will rise. That's a fact. I don't need you, you know. Greet my teeth and make a great effort to know and to believe that the sun will rise in the morning because it's a fact. I don't need a great a mountain of faith to know that the sun will set in the night. That is a fact. I do not need a great mountain of faith, you know, that the river will flow. And if I go to the river, I'll get enough water. That's a fact. And when you have a fact, then you understand this will happen. Good things will happen to you. You know that if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Why? That's a fact. Whosoever 
shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a fact. You know that God is holy and he wants you to be holy. That's a fact. And if you go to God and you say, Lord, by myself, in my self-effort, I cannot be holy. I come to you. I want you to grant me that nature of yours, which is holiness. It's a fact that he is holy and he wants you to be holy. And what he wants to do, he will do. That is a fact. I do not have enough power to carry out everything I need to carry out. I come to God. It's a God of power. And he does not want his followers uh, to, be, uh, to be weaklings. And then I come. It's a fact that he is powerful and he will transfer his power, heaven's power, into your life in Jesus' name. The fact, the fact, the fact of God's immeasurable possibilities. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 32. And I'm reading from verse 17 here. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth. That's a fact. That's a fact. I don't need to search all around. I don't need to look for where is the man that created the world. No man can create the world in which we live. Here is the fact that God made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and stretch out arm and there is nothing too hard for thee. That's, that's right, that's right. There is nothing, nothing in my little life. Think about the moon, and think about the stars, and think about the sun, and think about all the planets, think about all the orbits and everything, and God regulates that, and the stars do not fall, and the moon does not fall. Look at the fact, he made the heavens and the earth. As I look at that, that fact of God's creating the whole universe, not only our world, that fact that God by his great power and stretch out arm created everything, that fact settles me. That fact will settle you. You go through life, you, you see everything I see, that's the work of my father. Everything I feel, that's the work of my father. Look at the solid ground. Maybe you came here many years ago and the ground was solid. And you have come today and that the same ground is still solid. And it is God that did that. The fact of God's immeasurable possibilities, our God is able your God is able. Except you're serving a strange God. Except you're serving a God, the God of this world. If you're serving the God of heaven. If you are serving the God of all creation. Your God is mighty and powerful. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3. Looking at verse 20. Now unto him that is able. Somebody says my God is able. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. The power that created the whole world is that same power that dwells in us. All things are possible with him, with you as you believe, all things are possible. Look at number two here. Number two, our faith in God's immense power. Our faith in God's immense power. Look at what God has done. Look at that mountain. I mean, real physical mountain. It takes God to create that. And man cannot even lift it up, that mountain. 
and that's what God has. His power is immense. His power is great beyond mention. His power is great beyond our analysis, our studies, and our understanding. And we have faith in that immense power of our God. We're looking at Job chapter 42 and we're looking at verse 2. Job chapter 42 verse 2. I know, you see, we suffer a lot when we think of ourselves. Job had been sick, boils all over him. And all that time that his friends came, his friends spoke about Job. And they argued about Job. And Job replied and talked about himself. I am this, check my record. I am that, check my record. All the people around me, they know how I take care of them, I think of them, I manifest that, manifest this. The sickness remained there. But when he came to think about God, he forgot himself. There are times your problems will be solved when you forget yourself and you think about God and God alone. And Job came to that in verse 2. He says, I know that thou canst do everything that the knowledge we have. Am I sick? I know God can do all things. Am I powerless to confront the challenges in my life? I know God can do all things. Am I so weak in my personal life? I'm not able to overcome common or common temptations. I know God can do everything. Do I have a need that my substance, all my resources cannot supply a meet? I know God can do everything. When we come to that understanding and we understand that our God has immense power and we have that faith and confidence and trust in him, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withheld, withholding from thee when we come to that our problems are over. My problems are over. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. When he came to the realization of the immense power of God, of the immeasurable possibilities in God, and God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, not when he prayed for himself, when he knew that God will do this. And all he has told me to do now is to pray for my friends who are criticizing me. When he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Your time has come. Yeah. I said your time has come. Yeah. I want you to think, I want you to think twice as much as he had before. Twice as much faith as I had before. Twice as much confidence as I had before. Twice as much resources as I had before. Twice as much joy as I had before. Twice as much of faith and power and strength as I had before. He'll give you twice, beyond twice of what you had before. Amen. The certainty of salvation 
the joy of salvation, the confidence in salvation, the power to live and overcome in life twice as I had before. As you move on in your Christian ministerial journey, professional journey, you'll come across twice as you had before. Yeah. And now you need to begin to think, uh, if I had twice as much of faith as I had before, what will I do? What will I attend? And how will I go on in ministry? If I had twice as much love as I had before, how will I act? How will I behave? How will I touch other people's lives? If I had twice as much riches of wealth as I had before, what will I do? If I have twice as all that I have possessed in the past in strength, in power, in ability, in skill. If I add twice as I had before, what will I do? Begin to plan because you are going to go higher. Yeah. And you are going to do greater. And you'll have twice as much as you had before. Because your faith is in God's immense power. Number three here. Number three, the faithfulness to God's immutable promises. Immutable promises. I want to look, you to look in your mind at the promises of God in Genesis, in Exodus, and come to the other books of the Bible in the Psalms, the promises we have there, and then come to Matthew and look at the promises there, and Mark and Luke and John, and look at the promises there, and look at the epistles, look at Romans, and look at First Peter, Second Peter, and look at Revelation, and just look at promises, 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 and God is faithful to all his promises which are immutable immutable cannot change cannot change what god said he will do he will do why don't you in the morning hours when you're having your family devotion when you're having your personal quiet time just look at the promises relating to your spirit relating to your soul relating to your body relating to your family relating to everything you do and everywhere you go in life just look at those promises every one of those promises will be yes and amen in your life in Jesus name. The faithfulness to God's immutable promises. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 6 and I'm reading from verse 17. Hebrews chapter 6 we're looking at verse 17 wherein God will in more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed age by an oath you know that if an ordinary man makes a promise and then he swears to that he takes an oath and you take it to court and you validate that oath that man generally it will be impossible for him to say uh-uh i didn't mean that when god the god of heaven makes a promise that he will save whosoever cometh unto him when god makes a promise that he will sanctify you by his truth when god makes his promise that you receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and you'll be witnesses unto him in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. When God makes a promise that will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, and he swears to it, that promise is immutable. Everything you come to God to claim this morning, everything he will do. He cannot lie. 
and he cannot deny himself what he said he will do. He will do in your life today in Jesus. He says, by, he says, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, that by two immutable things in the which it was impossible for God to lie. Can God lie to you? What then do you go to God and say, God, I'm suffering. And then you start crying. You're talking to somebody that as if you want to force him. As if, if I don't cry, it will not fulfill his word. If I don't roll on the ground, it will forget what he has said. Ah, you're rolling on the ground cannot improve on the nature of God. Your crying cannot improve on the nature of God. His nature is that he cannot lie. And what he has said, he will fulfill. And so he tells us that by two, he mutes things in the which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation because we know he's faithful we can have a strong consolation who are fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us your way is clear today Look at point number three here. Number three, our distinct consecration. That's what consecration just means. Commitment as God's people. Now we understand, we know who our God is. A boy, a girl is going to school. And he knows that all the needs will be supplied. He doesn't have any kind of misgiving. The teacher said yesterday, the principal said yesterday, the headmaster said yesterday, if you don't pay your school fees, you'll be turned back at the gate. And that boy, knowing his father, responsible father, rich father, and a dependable father, all that the teacher said, the child will say, is saying that to other people. That cannot be for me. I know my father, responsible and rich and dependable. And the child walks confidently each of the gate. It's not even looking back. Are they going to stop me? He says, no, I'm not the kind of person that can stop. You are not the kind of person that can stop. <laughs> Your father has made adequate provision from all eternity until this time, until the future eternity. Everything for your soul, for your spirit, for your body, everything for your life, for your ministry, for your profession, the father responsible father, rich father, dependable father, the father has made adequate provision for me. I said for me. It doesn't matter, I'm, you know, in this church, no, I'm of that church, I'm of that church. If God is your heavenly father, he has made adequate, sufficient provision for you. Everywhere, anywhere you go in life, you don't have to look back, will this happen, will that happen? It has happened already. Because our father is faithful and because of that we can have a definite distinct commitment consecration as god's people anyone belonging to god there your future is guaranteed <laughs> look at this now in mark chapter 10 and i'm reading from verse 26 and they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves who then can be saved. And then in verse 27, and Jesus looking upon them. I want Jesus to look upon me. 
I want Jesus because I know he's not going to classify me with that rich young ruler that ran away. He looks at me in love. He looks at me with confidence. He looks at me with trust. I want Jesus to look upon me. He will look upon you. All your fears are gone. All your misgivings are gone. And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then in verse 28, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all. What that man was unwilling to do. You've given us the grace and the strength and the power and the knowledge and the integrity to do that. We have left all and have followed thee. And then in verse 29, and Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man in that generation or in this generation, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's sake. In verse 20, in verse 30, but he shall receive. He shall receive. He shall receive yeah. an hundredfold, hold on, hold on. An hundredfold means whatever he has left, the Lord will multiply by one hundred yeah. and give it back to you. Yeah. It's good news for those who have left something. It's bad news for those who have left zero, nothing. Since they became, they said they have become Christians. I'm a born again child of God. I am saved. I'm a follower of Christ. My friend, what have you left? If you have left nothing, that's zero. God will still give you a hundredfold of what you have left. Zero times one hundred is he left nothing and the Lord has given him a hundredfold of what he left. If you have left two, multiply that by hundred. If you have left twenty, multiply that by hundred. The higher, the greater of things you have left behind. They are not simple things. Father, mother, children, houses, land, not sinful things, but if you know that they will take your interest away from fulfilling the will of God and the calling of God in your life, you leave them and God will see your sincerity and your commitment and it will multiply by 100 and give back unto you. Yeah. Unto me. Yeah. Unto me. Yeah. And then it says, in this life, he'll give the 100 fold, and then he says, with persecution. When I was younger, I used to think about the persecution, but you know, if you think about the 100 fold that the Lord gives you, those who are jealous of what you have, and those who are envious of what you have, and then they look at you and belittle you, that one does not matter. When you see the hundred fold the Lord has given you, don't look at the persecution, don't look at the belittling of who you are, and don't look at their ridicule. Look at your hundredfold multiplication. You'll be happy every day of your life. And then he says, in the life to come, in the world to come, eternal life. I have it. Three things very quickly. Number one, we have left all. We now love all. We are listed all. For God's supply. Number one, we have left all in glorious salvation. Number one, 
we have left all. Number two, we now love all for the gospel's sake. Number three, we are listed all for God's supply. Amen. Amen. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Those I counted loss for Christ. Have you counted any significant sin in life, position, connections, riches, things that you had that other people said is a lucky woman? It's a lucky woman that now because you come to christ you say because of the calling of christ the ministry the lord has given me i joyfully relinquish that give that up so that i can win the hundredfold it says but what things were gained to me those i counted loss for christ in verse 8 it says yea doubtless and i count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and all the riches in Christ. We're coming to number two here. Number two here, we now love all for the gospel's sake. Gone were the days. I love my tribe. I don't love that tribe no more. Gone were the days. I love and protect the things that I do. But what others do if it crumbles, if it's falling, if it's scattered, I don't mind going what the days. Now, we now love all. What we love for ourselves, the joy in service, the power in the Lord, the confidence in the Lord. What we love for ourselves, we now love for everyone. Because now, we love all for the gospel's sake and we love the totality of the word of god we're looking at john chapter 21 verse 15 in john 21 verse 15 so then when they had dined jesus says unto simon peter simon son of jonas lovest thou me more than these they had caught a great number of fish and now the lord wants to check up peter the first time i met you i told you to throw your net there and you did and you caught a lot and then i said follow me and you left all and you followed me now some years have passed do you still love me more than your fish more than your net, more than your old gain, more than the things you used to have. And can you still give them up for me? Jesus said, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Thou knowest. If you say you love God above the fish, above the net, you love God above property, above land, above money, above everything you count precious here on earth, does Christ know? Does Christ know? Does the Lord, your Savior, your Lord, the God of your salvation, does he know that truly you love him above all? He says, yes, Lord, thou knowest 
that I love you. It's after that, if you love money more than him, go after your money. If you love the things of this world more than him, all right, go ahead. And after the things you put your heart, your love on. But if you love, love Christ, love the Savior more than your own petty ideas, more than your own petty belongings. If you love him more than you love every other sin, he says unto him, feed my lambs. I pray that our love for Christ will be above and beyond our love, our desire for anything in this world. Amen, Amen confirmed in your life. Amen. Number three here, number three, we enlisted all for God's supply. We have left all. We now love all, and because of that, we are listed for God's supply. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard, and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Amen. Those things, Paul the Apostle did not excuse his hearers and say, I understand, I'm an apostle, and you are members of the church, and you are ministers, lower in rank, to the apostle, I know you cannot do what I do. No, he didn't say that. Paul the apostle, with all his commitment, all his consecration, all his submission, all his surrender unto God, all his love for God, he said, all those things which you have both learned and received and heard, and seen in me do the same grace in him that same grace will be in your life Amen. human beings unaided cannot do this with men unaided graceless this is impossible but not with god for with god in your life in your family your ministry in your Christian work, in your Christian devotion, with God, all things are possible. And so you can do, you must do, you will do everything you have learned. And the God of peace shall be with you. Look at, look at verse 19. In verse 19, but my God shall supply. Is he, is he able to supply in your life? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. According to his riches in glory. Peep into heaven and see how rich heaven is. All the spare parts of every car according to its riches, all the spare parts in your working body according to its riches in glory, all needs of man today and tomorrow until it crosses over to eternity according to its riches in glory, heaven is so rich. It will supply every need of your life and my God shall supply shall supply how much of your needs really really how much of your needs today this week and the rest of your life how much of your needs 
all you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Insufficiency in man, total supply in God. Impossibility in man, possibility in God. Powerlessness in man, might, power, majesty, supply in the almighty God. It's your turn to claim everything he has promised, salvation, sanctification, baptism, power in the Holy Ghost, and total supply, all sufficient supply, everything available for you. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, here I am. I know with man this is impossible, but not with God. Because with God in your life, God in your family, God in your ministry, God in your profession, God in the situation in, in that you find yourself, with God all things are possible.